Uh, my name is Neil Kelly. I'm a regional extension agent. I cover the southeast corner of the state of Alabama. I'm down here what we kind of consider the wiregrass region. Um, and so a lot of things that I refer to and I talk soil types, things like that, it's a lot of stuff that I've dealt with uh, during my career with extension. But, you know, with that, I'm, I'm supposed to be talking blueberry fertilization, so I'll get on with it. But before we can actually get down into the fertilizers and what type of fertilizer and how much to use, I think there's several other things that we need to keep in mind that are unique and different um, to blueberries. Uh, I'm trying to get my slideshow. Okay, there we go. Um, first things first, you know, I think a soil test is absolutely necessary. It's, it's just critical. We have to do it with blueberries. We all know that uh, a blueberry is different in nature because it likes an acidic type soil, um, much more acidic than most any other fruit crop could even stand or even survive in. And depending on what kind of reports you read or where you get your information from, I've heard things from four twos to five twos to four fives to five fives, four O's to five O's, four O's to five twos. That number seems to kind of dance around a little bit. Um, my take home from that is that absolutely your soil pH needs to be a 5.5 before you or less or less before you ever even consider planting. I would have my soil pH right before I even ordered my blueberry plants or bought blueberry plants um, because you know that soil pH is going to affect the uh, nutrient uptake of the plant things like that so it all plays into a, a good sound fertility program. And that's something that it takes a long time to change in the soil profile. It's not something you just go out there and change overnight. So uh, this was a real issue for some of my growers probably back 10, 10 or so years ago when they got into the blueberry business. Um, this was a major issue for us. And as Alina might have mentioned, as you all, you all, she mentioned earlier about the organic matter, you know, some of those half a percent organic matter soils, those are the very soils that we are dealing with down here. It's a... Uh, it's a, a extremely weathered coastal plain, sandy type soil, uh, very little organic matter. Uh, and obviously, you know, that organic matter is important when it comes to CEC of the soils and its ability to hold nutrients and water and um, for things to be available to the plant. You know, with organic matter, you increase that organic matter 1% in your soil uh, and you can release up to extra like 15 pounds of nitrogen a year. So as that, as that organic matter increases, that CEC is going to increase, that overall soil quality is going to increase, and you're going to get that much more efficient use out of the fertilizers that you do apply. Um, one of the other things that we really didn't think about when we got started uh, was our water. But in this area, we're pumping out of a, a, a deep limestone aquifer. And so most of our well water is uh, 8.0 or higher in pH. And not only that, the total alkalinity of that water was running somewhere around 150 parts per million. Um, any of the reading and research that you do on blueberries will tell you if you start to get over that 130 part per million total alkalinity of your water, that you're going to have to do some type of water treatment um, to your irrigation water. What we were essentially doing was kind of slow dripping lime to them, if you will. And, and it just caused a real problem when you start talking about the kind of uh, irrigation events that we have to have during our summer months to get us through. The um, uh, way we did that was through sulfuric acid injections. And that's not something that just everybody wants to get into. So those are, those are three things I, I would really recommend that growers kind of look into before we ever get as far as a actual fertility program. When I was putting this slideshow together and doing some digging and all, I ran across a few statements um, that, that I found that were made by colleagues, different universities, different researchers and things. And, you know, looking back to my experience that we had in this area with blueberries, these are actually kind of, they seem simple, but yet they're very profound statements or comments, if you will. And I wish a lot of our growers had had read some of these things as we got started, but you can see here from uh, Dr. Kruger and Nesmith over University of Georgia, you know, since blueberries evolved in areas with low nutrient content, they can survive with a surprising low level of fertilization. However, over the test of time, it has been clearly shown that for rapid growth of young plants and high yields of older plants, a good fertilization program is necessary. 
Uh, and, you know, when you kind of look at that, I remember people, uh, I hear people make comments say, oh, well, blueberries, they do good in poor soils. They can handle poor soil conditions. The poorer the soil, the better blueberries like it or things like that. And, and that's just not necessarily true. Uh, yes, they can survive, but you're talking about commercial production. We don't want to just be surviving. We want to be thriving. We've got to have high yields. We've got to have high quality fruit. We've got to have highly marketable fruit in order for this thing to be economically uh, feasible. So we want to do a lot more than just survive. Um, and there, toward the end of that statement, they say, you know, a good fertilization program. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean a lot of fertilizer or put out large amounts of fertilizer. I think what they're referring to here is just a good, stable, steady, sound fertility program. And, and I think that's kind of illustrated through this next slide. You know, another comment they had, mature rabbit eyes should not be over fertilized. Over fertilization results in excessive bush height, additional pruning, poor quality fruit, and, ex uh, and excessive shading of the bush interior. You know, as long as we're getting four to five inches of new growth on lateral barren twigs should be adequate for good production. Um, we're getting what we need out of that. So, you know, just because a little bit helps, a lot is not going to make the problem better. Uh, here's another one I ran across by Jeff Williamson and Paul Arena, University of Florida. You know, blueberries respond best to frequent light fertilization. They can be killed or damaged by over fertilization. It is best to begin on the lean side and gradually increase fertilizer rates as you gain experience with your soil type and the kinds of fertilizers you are using. Uh, and I think this is very true. You know, we ran into a lot of problems early in the our blueberry uh, days, if you will. Uh, when I first started with extension, we had a lot of commercial growers putting in large acreage orchards and we ran into a lot of issues. And some of those guys started putting out a little bit more fertilizer, a little bit more fertilizer. And of course they saw a little bit better growth and a little bit better growth. And then they kind of went overboard with it. They're like, well, if a little is, is, is good, then a lot is better. And they started pumping excessive nitrogen uh, to these blueberries and so we wound up with this real big flush of growth but the bottom line is we did not have a root system under it to support it so we kind of did full circle and we wound up right back where we were so um, I think these are kind of three very kind of profound statements uh, that that all growers should kind of refer back to from time to time just to sort of keep us in check. Uh, talk a little bit about fertilization. Typically what we're talking about are the big three, if you will, the macronutrients. We're talking about our nitrogen, our phosphorus, and our potassium. And to look at these a little bit more, you know, nitrogen, we all know that nitrogen is kind of responsible for the leafy growth, for the foliage growth. It's very important in uh, protein synthesis, formation of proteins. Um, we also know that nitrogen readily leaches in the soil. We lose a lot of nitrogen to volatilization. That's one reason when you get a soil test report, you will actually not get a uh, soil content on your nitrogen level because they don't actually test for soil nitrogen. The recommendation is known uh, is just for based off of known crop needs um, because that's constantly changing. It's highly variable in our soils. Um, your phosphorus levels, they're a little bit different. We do actually test for soil phosphorus levels. And that's because uh, the soil phosphorus, it hangs around much longer than our other two elements. Uh, you can build up levels of phosphorus in your soil. And at some point uh, you may get to a situation where you don't need to uh, add a phosphorus fertilizer. And we might change our, our fertilizer uh, analysis a little bit, if you will, as we, as we move through production. Um, but phosphorus is uh, responsible for, for root growth. It aids in root growth. It aids in energy transfer in the plant. And so, you know, phosphorus is important and uh, blueberries do require and do benefit from application of uh, phosphorus fertilizers. The next one there, the potassium, you know, it hangs around in the soil uh, longer than nitrogen. Um, but uh, not as long as what phosphorus might be. It's used probably in a little bit larger quantities by the plant than what the phosphorus is. 
And so we're going to be making a uh, little more uh, potassium applications than we would phosphorus applications. So your nitrogen and your potassium is probably what the plant's going to use the most. Uh, and typically our, our fertilizer analysis are going to contain it, uh, nitrogen and potassium. They may or may not contain a phosphorus content. Uh, talking a little bit about that on your soil test report, when you get back uh, your soil test report, it will rate your phosphorus and potassium levels as very high, high, medium, low, or very low. And so uh, if those phosphorus levels are at very high or high, it's probably not going to call for any phosphorus fertilizer to be applied. Now, if they fall in that medium to low range, I think there's still a benefit for making that phosphorus application uh, to your blueberries. Now, my next statement there, you know, a one-to-one -one ratio fertilizer, such as a triple 10, is kind of what a lot of people like to use, a triple 10, triple 13. Um, and, you know, that, that may not hurt anything, but it may not be required. If your soil tests say that you have high levels of phosphorus, you know, you can leave out that middle number. You might can find a cheaper source of fertilizer. You might use something like a 1248, a 1648, something that's low uh, in phosphorus fertilizer. So uh, we, we always try to give generic fertility recommendations and fertilizer recommendations, but it, I feel like it's really something that should be looked at on a case-by-case -case specific basis for every grower. Cause it's going to vary a little bit depending on where you are, what type of soil you're on. Uh, and not only that, whatever your expectation for the crop is. Now, blueberry plants do respond better to ammonium or a urea form of nitrogen. Um, this used to be a big thing. I used to always tell growers, you know, try to find something that's based from ammonium sulfate. Uh, stay away from the ammonium nitrate blended fertilizers. That's really not as big a thing as it used to be because of all the bombing that took place at the, uh, at the, in, in, at the, uh, in Oklahoma City, I'll spit it out in a second, Oklahoma City, and then Department of Homeland Security came out and they placed all kinds of regulations on ammonium nitrate because of its explosive natures and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of these companies shifted away from ammonium nitrate and went to uh, what actually was a little bit cheaper forms of nitrogen anyway, the ammonium sulfate and urea at the time were cheaper. Uh, they moved to those for their nitrogen source. So most of your bag product is bagged out of a sulfate or either a urea blend nowadays anyway. Uh, and again, blueberries, they are sensitive to fertilizer burn. So uh, you'll see in a moment that we recommend uh, to take it easy, but you know, the only way to, to uh, get over that fertilizer burn once the damage is done is, is with time. And time is money when you're talking commercial production. What we like to see is we like to see smaller applications, uh, smaller, more frequent applications of fertilizers, something along the lines of say years one and two, you might be making three to four applications a year. Uh, as you develop a root system, as those plants start to mature um, and get out of those first two years of growth, year three through six, you may look at something like two to three applications. And typically what it is is that year six, the plant's considered mature, and we just kind of stay on the same fertility program from then on. Uh, or we're either going by tissue analysis, things like that to adjust your fertility program to fit your needs. Uh, but years one and two, three to four application, years three through six, you might bump that back to maybe two to three applications a year. Typically you're going to start with bud break, and go all the way through harvest. You want to broadcast in a large circle around the plant. A lot of times we really recommend uh, fertilizing on a plant by plant basis. That's the, that's the best way to do it uh, for a lot of our growers. And the thing is, is to sprinkle the fertilizer over a large circle around the plant. Don't just throw it right at the base of the plant, uh, run the risk of that, that fertilizer injury. 1648, 1248 are all sources that you see at these big lawn and garden centers. It's a common common formulation you find a lot of bag fertilizer and you know again they're well suited for blueberries what you notice is that ratio that 16 4 8 ratio that kind of um 3 1 2 type ratio there uh is a little bit lower in phosphorus and and for a lot of our soils that that's fine uh again urea is often found mixed in these formulations urea is a, a great fertilizer source for blueberries um, you know, smaller growers, if you only have one or two plants that you need to fertilize, you don't need a 50 pound bag of fertilizer. 
you may find these little azalea and camellia fertilizers at the big box stores in a little four pound bag. Uh, typically that kind of stuff will work fine for you as well. Here's just uh, several different labels. I took some pictures. Um, and, and if you'll notice, if you look in the fine print or where they get that, where they derive the nitrogen from, you see those are anemonical nitrogen, uh, urea nitrogen, and that's what I was telling you about this bag product nowadays. Uh, you're hard pressed to actually find ammonium nitrate bagged anymore. You just don't do it. If any of y'all remember that Greenfields fertilizer right there in the center, 3400, that's what they used to bag as ammonium nitrate. And it was true ammonium nitrate. It was a 3400. Uh, Greenfields was just a brand, if you will, that Red Fox Company put out. And what they did is they've gone back to using that same Greenfields brand again, just because it was known by people. Uh, but if you look down at that guaranteed analysis, the total nitrogen, yes, 34%, but 24.82 of that comes from a urea-based nitrogen. It's not actually ammonium nitrate in that bag anymore. So the, the current day Greenfields 3400 is not the same Greenfields 3400 it was 10, 12 years ago. And if you'll notice, they also added a sulfur, about a 10 or 12% sulfur uh, content to that also. So technically the analysis on that would be a 340012 because it has that sulfur content. Uh, I just found that kind of interesting when I was at the hardware store the other day. But anyway, these would all be accept acceptable uh, forms of fertilizer. The one in the top right, you see that, that is a uh, slow release fertilizer there. So, um, you know, be careful with some of the slow release. The cheaper product is not that reliable. The rate of release on it uh, is, is not that reliable. Now, if you get the more expensive polymer coated products, the rate of release on those are a lot more reliable and it's a lot better product, but it's going to cost a lot more. So, it, you know, it may or may not be economically feasible on a large scale to use some of the slow release fertilizers. Uh, again, we always have questions about organic fertilizers and we do have some organic growers. Um, so, you know, you might look at something like cottonseed meal, which is going to be around a 632 type analysis. You can put two ounces per plant per year of age, um, up to about 12 or so pounds per plant. You know, the thing about organic fertilizers is they're typically very low in nutrient content. Uh, so you're going to have to apply more of them, but just be careful. You can overdo it on organic fertilizers, just like you can conventional fertilizers. Uh, some people may choose to use manures. You know, I, I put a big question mark out there because, A, you obviously have to be very careful with manure and timing of application because you're harvesting something that uh, odds are going to be consumed fresh. So you have to worry about the food safety aspect of using manures. And there again, uh, manures are not consistent in their analysis. So you would definitely need to send off samples and be sure of what you were putting out um, if you chose to use manures. And if you are an organic producer, then obviously you've got to play into mind the uh, national organic standard, the protocol for using uh, manures and still um, meeting your organic certification. So. That's something you better dig into before you just jump out there and start using any type of uh, raw manure product as a fertilizer. And again, you know, organic fertilizers may work for smaller growers, or if you are a certified organic grower and you're demanding uh, a higher price for your product and you're getting that premium price point for your product, um, but odds are they're probably too expensive for any commercial grower. Uh, so kind of the meat and potatoes, I know what everybody's been waiting for, you know, how much fertilizer do we put per season? And this is kind of general recommendation, guys. Uh, uh, you know, don't take this too literal because it can vary so much from situation to situation. Uh, but year one, you're looking at one ounce of, uh, say, triple 10. And that would be per application. That's per plant per application. So you think about it, if we're doing two to three uh, applications a year, you're looking at somewhere around about three ounces of the triple 10. Um, you know, I put the P out there with a the question mark and, and that's phosphorus is what I'm talking about there. Depending on what your soil test said, you know, you could drop the triple 10 that, that first year and you might just do a 12, four, eight the first year also. Uh, just depends on what our soil phosphorus levels are but do make sure that uh, you are in that 
that that medium to high range because blueberries do get a, a benefit from that phosphorus application. Year two, you'd go to something like 1.2 ounces of a 12.48, and again, this is this is per plant uh, per application. Uh, year three, jump that up to 2.5 ounces. Year four, 3.7. Year five, jump up to five ounces. And when you get to that six and older, what we do is we kind of flatline at about a 6.7 ounces, and that's per application per plant. Because then what we're wanting to do is make sure that they have enough fertility that they uh, put on a good crop load that we're still getting good quality fruit off of the plant, but we're not wanting to overdo it. In a commercial setting, um, we're going to top our berries out. Year six is when they're considered mature. That's probably when we're going to start doing some cane renewal thinning, things like that, because we want to keep that fruiting wood somewhere under six feet in height or less for the harvesters to go through there, even if you're hand harvesting so that you can harvest most of that bush. So around year six is where we start to kind of flatline on our, on our fertilizer. Um, you obviously, you need to be pulling tissue samples, send in tissue samples uh, and adjust and tweak your fertilizer program to fit your needs, depending on your soil test result and your tissue analysis. And I think that's something that growers don't do enough is the tissue analysis. I think we should all utilize that a lot more than we probably do. Uh, that's some very valuable information that gives you a snapshot in the middle of the season about what's going on, uh, what your plant might be lacking in, what you might possibly need to put out a little bit heavier uh, because of your situation. Uh, and again, just space those applications out, you know, make one application when the plant starts to grow. In my part of the world, that might be first of April. Uh, again, about six weeks later, middle of June, and again, six or so weeks after August, what we want to do is we want to push a little bit of that late season growth. The one thing you don't want to do is make that last application too late in the year. You want to give that plant time to take that last application up to put on a little bit of new growth and then give that new growth time to harden off before we go into the winter because that's that hard, that seasoned growth will survive the cold weather a lot better than, than really young, tender, fresh growth. So, you know, don't, don't make that last application of the year too awful late in the year. You want a good six weeks or so uh, between that last application and uh, your frost date, if you will, uh, so that that growth has time to harden off some before winter. And I know that's a real, real quick kind of brief snapshot on the fertilizer stuff. Um, like I say, I, I get a lot of questions about, about fertility and, and, and common fertilizer programs. And that's probably one of the things that um, I really feel like should be looked at on a case by case uh, situation in, uh, in your particular instance. But uh, anyway, with that, David, I'll turn it back over. I know we're a few minutes over, but uh, if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me or, or put those in the chat box. One thing I will throw out real quick, uh, smallfruit.org, that's the Southern Fruit Consortium website. Uh, there's a lot of very valuable information on there. And actually Dr. Kruger and Nesmith, uh, they go really deep into fertilization on blueberries, get really technical with it. Um, and, and all that information is there on that, on that website. And that's an excellent resource for our growers.